Is Ukraine continuing to take more and more slices of Bakhmut while still advancing in the South? And more importantly, what has emerged from the NATO summit? And what does it mean for Ukraine? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It's July 12th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get right into it. Okay, first, let's take a look at the control map. And there's actually been a number of, of fairly minor changes, right? You can see, boom, uh, Ukrainian forces advancing a bit towards Robdine. Uh, Russian forces still probably holding what looks like a uh, forested position on a hilltop this is going to be tough to dislodge right assaulting up a hill is hard assaulting through these wood lines is also hard but you can see that it i suspect that it overlooks the outskirts of robtine so this has been uh somewhere where ukrainian forces have been trying to advance for a long time you can see that robtine itself is defended on two sides right likely by uh russian entrenched positions here uh that i imagine you may not be able to see because it's not uh, visible in satellite photos um, but almost certainly, Russians never let a good defensive position go to waste. And then on the west side, of course, the approach is defended by these two, uh, these dual trench lines here. Um, so certainly, Ukraine is going to have its work cut out for it uh, as it approaches the area. Um, when we back it up, we could see there's also been some level of, well, this isn't really advanced. This is more like uh, changing technicalities of the map since blue represents uh, areas that have been liberated within the last two weeks, and it's been two weeks since that's been liberated. So not really all that exceptional. Um, the Where they do see some changes, first off, is Russian forces withdrawing from this key uh, forested area outside of Klitschivka. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we've talked about here in Klitschivka is that there's some natural defensive barriers, and Ukraine has been doing a pretty good job of systematically clearing them out. Um, again, we're not seeing lightning breakthroughs, but you can see they control the entirety of this canal. They really are on the outskirts of Klitschivka um, and uh, simultaneously on the outskirts of Bakhmut. So what I think you're going to see is them try to advance and seize this town of Klitschivka as part of this goal of encircling Bakhmut. Again, at the pace they're going now, Ukraine is going to have a hard time completing an encirclement of Bakhmut simply because Russian forces are not going to be caught flat-footed or by surprise or encircled uh, uh, faster than they expect. And I think that itself is a, uh, I don't want to say a flaw, but it's sort of a, a trade-off that Ukraine is making through this more salami slice piecemeal type of offensive work. Um Right. There's also a little bit of progress uh, up here. Yeah, you can see another um, large, another fairly substantial chunk of, of wind breaks outside Rozdolivka has been seized uh, while they're still advancing on some established Russian trench lines outside of Solidar. But you can see that these are in some ways more vulnerable simply because they appear to just be a single trench line. But they could also have Russian reserves sitting in Solidar uh, to fulfill that counterattack function. Um, Anyway, the other, let's see if, make sure I make sure I covered everything for you guys that's in this update. The other change, well, we'll talk about that in a sec. But in the last five hours, though, there's probably additional changes. Uh, most notably, that while the map has this plotted as uh, three locations out of advance outside of Kurdyomivka, uh, which itself is significant, right? This is depicting uh, the t most of downtown Kurdyumivka as being under Ukrainian control. Again, significant because it represents Ukrainian forces crossing this canal, a natural barrier. Um, you also, of course, have uh, this depicting uh, large portions of downtown Klitschivka as being contested. So a sign that uh, in some ways, right, this is, I think, some of this is just mapping software different mappers assessing different things um as, as larger areas as, as listed as contested um but what's notable is that according to the actual statement from the ukrainian ministry of defense the advances have happened north and south in bakhmut um as well as uh the bilahora and drivka and bilahora kurdyomivka directions so that itself is interesting right um given that uh, I think this is trying to say that this is Bilahora, Klitschivka, and Kurdyumivka. So these two advances uh, is where we're seeing 
Ukrainian forces really pushed. So again, moving towards advancing in the south of Bakhmut, but there's also probably been some gains in the north as well. And they're probably pretty marginal as we've seen here, but this is still not insignificant in that Ukrainian forces are continuing to sustain momentum. They're not trying to achieve big, overwhelming breakthroughs, um, but instead trying to attrit and slice off Russian forces while simultaneously targeting uh, many of their logistic centers, right? They're trying to win it, it, through the Kherson offensive, not the Kharkiv offensive, right? In Kherson, of course, it was about attritional warfare and making it very hard for Russia to resupply its troops. I think something similar is being attempted now by Ukraine. The uh, final and most up-to-date news, of course, that's not yet reported on these maps, is that actually along Kremina, we're seeing Russian forces advance uh, into a into uh, Torsk. Uh, when we look at the maps here, we'll take a look at it right here. I'll show you guys where Torsk is. Um, this is up in the north, right? You can see Russian forces for some time have been engaged in, in an effort to push along this Crimean alignment axis. Um, and you can see here, they're assessed as being right outside of uh, this the town of Torsk. So this has been a long time coming, a lot of fighting and a lot of effort by Russian forces to achieve any kind of advance. So the fact that they have it all is is in its way sort of impressive, um, <laughs> given that they are losing territory in so many other areas. Um, and honestly, I, I don't think this is a great use of combat power. Russia's shown that it has really solid defensive tactics. And so I think they'd be better off focusing on those defensive tactics instead of uh, committing to uh, offensive operations of considerable difficulty and unclear return. Anyway, guys, if you want to see some of the combat footage coming out of this offensive, uh, you want to go to combatvetnews.com. Uh, this is the site I launched because Patreon and YouTube both have decided that they don't like my coverage of the conflict. But you can see I've got all sorts of news stories on here for free, um, as well as all my YouTube videos on here for free. But if you become a member, you get to not only support what I do, look at uh, uh, keep me independent. Um, and any one of these tiers is also going to get you access to the exclusive room on the Discord. And it's going to get you uh, access to the members only content. And these are the videos I drop once or twice a week, looking at the most viral footage, the most viral videos of the week. Uh, they're almost always combat videos that we can't, uh, that give us insights into operations that we can't get anywhere else, right? You could uh, certainly, everybody can misreport. Um, about what's happening on the front lines, but you can't deny some of these combat videos. So it's some of the best insight we can get. And if you want to support it, check it out. Links up there in the description and in a pinned comment. Okay, let's talk about the NATO summit in Vilnius. And this is really interesting. Uh, one, because it's something that both Ukraine and Russia are very, very focused on. Um, and the expectation is that a lot of these G7 countries are going to issue a declaration on how they're going to help Kiev defeat Russia, right, to turn to aggression. Uh, and it describes it in the years to come while it sits in NATO's waiting room. Um, and Zelensky, of course, saying he wants to get on the same page as NATO, since Zelensky really wants to advocate for Ukraine becoming a member of the NATO alliance, uh, in contrast to uh, the NATO themselves who recognize that they cannot bring in a new member who is engaged in a war as it would immediately trigger article five in all likelihood and draw NATO countries into direct conflict with Russia, something that they want to avoid. Um, so what's also interesting, right? Is there's going to uh, be some sort of a lot of work to try to align the bilateral deals that Kiev is getting, making sure that, uh, the packages that are provided to Kiev um, are not duplicative, are mutually supporting, reflect the same strategy and coordination among NATO countries. Uh, this is, of course, just a simple improvement of efficiency of this aid. Um, and there's all, and he actually, U.S. President Joe Biden has floated a model for Ukraine similar to one in which the 
D.C. has committed to giving Israel billions of dollars a year over a period of a decade. And this sort of policy, this sort of long-term aid is honestly some of the best. Uh, and even when you say, oh, it's military aid, but remember, if your defense, if you're Ukraine and your defense budget is covered by the U.S., right? It enables you to spend in other areas, hopefully, is the idea. Uh, sort of like how if someone pays your rent, it enables you to go on vacation, right? Uh, but it do, you know, it doesn't mean your vacation was paid for, but functionally, it might as well have been. Don't The idea is that they don't go on vacation, right? You, you instead want that country to do things like get an education or get a better job or something, right? You want the the, the money you give to subsidize their defense to allow the country to spend its tax revenues on uh, programs that are going to make the country develop better. That's what happened in Israel, right? Uh, you know, it, it was a small agrarian nation that was just newly founded in the 40s and is now uh, one of the highest GDP per capita, maybe the highest GDP per capita Um uh, countries in the Middle East. And that's a function directly of receiving so much aid from the United States and other Western countries. So the idea is something similar may occur for Ukraine, uh, which again is better than the uh, support them until the war is over and then abandon them policy uh, that we the US followed in Afghanistan, which obviously went uh, not great. Um, of course, individual countries rolling out their own aid packages in conjunction with this meeting. Patriot missile defenses, armored vehicles worth almost a billion dollars from Germany. Um, but most critically, a coalition of 11 nations have announced they're going to start training Ukrainian pilots on F-16 jets next month. Uh, this can be huge uh, because simply Ukraine could really use the air power. Um, being able to dominate the skies is huge for uh, this offensive effort, right? The NATO doctrine, NATO forces are meant to be, are meant to have uh, air power, um, and if not air dominance. So giving Ukraine the uh, tools they need to at least attempt to establish some air dominance is going to be really significant. Um, and of course, I want to point out that as you guys can see, uh, <laughs> The let's see if we can find it here. The Russian forces, of course, in response to this NATO summit, launching a huge series of drone strikes across Ukraine, uh, which of course are as successful as typical drone strikes, meaning that uh, you know 26 of the 28 drones uh, were taken out by Ukrainian air defenses. So again, Russia symbolically communicating its displeasure. Anyway, guys, that's really all I had for you. Thank you guys so much to our Colonel tier members on combatvetnews.com. Thanks so much to our Lieutenant tier members. You guys are the ones who enable me to do this every day. I couldn't do this without you. I appreciate you so much, and I will see you guys in the next one. Cheers.